So welcome everyone to this talk on new developments in the S-Frame stack trace format. My name is Indu Bhagat. I work in the Linux tool chains team at Oracle. My colleague Jose is amongst you. Um, Jose has been involved in all discussions related to S-Frame format and he knows the format in and out. He has graciously agreed to be there in person. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite confident this will be productive for you guys, even though I couldn't be there in person. And I apologize for that. There were several things that happened and I couldn't make it in the end. Um, so today we'll talk about a brief history of S-Frame format first. And then we talk about why S-Frame, why do we have, why do we need yet another stack trace format in the picture? And then we go on to talk about some technical details about the format. And finally, we will talk about some new developments in the S-Frame uh, format. So S-Frame stands for Simple Frame Stack Trace Format. Um, interestingly, this has been, you know, in the discussion since it's been almost, it'll be almost a year now since we started talking about concepts around a new stack trace format. And initially when we were discussing these ideas around a new stack trace format, all those discussions were being done under the name CTF frame. And we got good feedback. We incorporated most of it when we released V1. But one of the questions or you know, a set of questions that kept coming back were how is this related to CTF? And do you need do I need CTF section for it? The questions themselves were easy to answer. You know, you can then and in general, you know, these wait these wind down after a while, but then it indicated that maybe potential users will also get confused in the future. So we decided to rename the format and Simple Frame was born. You know, the name was given as Simple Frame. We released the first version of the format in January 2023 with bin utils 2.40. And when we were discussing this format, e even during the initial stages, the, there were asks about, you know, uh, can you use such a thing for user space stack walking in the kernel? So around May, we we did a POC around um, you know S frame based user space stack unwinder in the Linux kernel. There were issues with the POC, and we will talk today about you know the issues and what was that POC all about. This was done around May, and but several good things came out of this POC. And one of the things that we did realize was there were some issues in the format specification. Uh, which we then resolved in the next release of Binutils, which was 2.41, and this was in July 2023. So this is briefly how things have evolved um, over the last year. So let's let's spend a few minutes to just you know talk about why S frame. Why do we need yet another stack tracing format um, in our tools? Um, we do see that there are a uh, you know, variety of formats already available. There are heuristic based methods. So um, yeah, the, from the, the solutions to generate, to generate stack traces varies from using heuristic based methods to, to well-defined debug format based methods, right? So EH frame is a, EH frame and other application specific formats. These are well-defined formats. They help you get precise asynchronous traces. So why add yet another one? That question does come. Um, so we need to look at the question from another perspective, which is that if if you have an application and if you want to do fast, low overhead stack tracing, which of these methods will you choose, right? So if that being the question, you look at frame pointer, you know that frame pointers are, you know, as a, as a mechanism, it's a very simple mechanism to implement. The stack tracing itself is extremely fast. But the problem with that method is there is going to be performance impact, especially on some architectures where you reserve the, reserve the hardware register, there's going to be performance impact because compiler has one less register. There's more code that you're executing in prologues and epilogues. And another problem that does come with this is that for those few instructions where you are setting up the frame pointer, the stack traces are not going to be precise, you will lose some context because for those instructions where you're setting up the RBP and you know saving and restore, uh, yeah, you cannot uh, stack trace easily. Um, then comes the EH frame based method. It's it's quite good in, in the sense that it is versatile. It's a compact format and um, you can use it across languages, platforms. So there are several good things for EH frame coming. 
But the problem with each frame or the one that's most commonly complained about is that the unwinder is becoming complex and it has high resource requirements. And in some cases, that's not feasible. We know of code bases which have deferred using EH frame for the longest time and have not uptaken EH frame based unwinding, right? Then the third class of solutions out there are application specific formats, ORC being one of them. So if you want to go ahead and design another application specific format for your application needs, yes, it's going to be fast. It's going to be, you know, the information is off band. The application format is designed for your application, so it will work. But the biggest problem with this approach is that this is not going to be supported in the tool chain. You will need to implement something like a reverse engineering of binaries. That is not the recommended route, right? You will hit the wall at some point. And so none of these methods seem to fulfill, right? Seem to fulfill the requirements of fast low overhead stack tracing. So what are the requirements? The requirements are as follows. If you want to do fast low overhead stack tracing, the format must support asynchronous stack tracing. Yeah, that's that's the first and foremost requirement. The, form the format must allow um, low overhead stack tracing. Thirdly, the stack tracer itself should be low complexity. And an important one is that it should be generated by the toolchain. So these set of requirements seem to, you know, uh, if, if the stack trace format fulfills these requirements, then it seems to be a good candidate for fast low overhead stack tracing. So this is where S-Frame comes in and it has been designed with these requirements in mind. And um, we hope it helps fulfill this use case of fast lower at stack tracing. So simple frame format was first defined in uh, Binu and implemented in Binutils 2.40. It has now seen a V2 release since Binutils 2.41. The spec is updated, um, you know, in the in the link here. Basically, simple frame format just encodes the minimal necessary information needed to stack trace. So per PC, you get the information about um, where is the CFA, what is the FP, and where is the return address. So if you get this information per PC, this is enough to stack trace. Um, the, support, uh, the support for the format exists only in the GNU tool, tool chain at this time. The current version is S-Frame V2. The format is defined for two ABIs at this time. AMD 64 and the APCS 64 calling convention. If and when there is need for more ABIs, more ar architectures, we'll need uh, most likely a format revision. Um, for on the x86 side and also for AR64 side, there is support for you know these um, these um, specific features. So for example, on the AR64 side, there is support to represent um, return address signing and whether the signing is done with key A, key B, and so on. Um, for PLDN entries, there is a specific representation that we allow so that the overall stack, you know, overall um, stack trace information that you're putting in the format is not bloated up. So PLDN entries are very well defined in the sense there are repeated instructions and what you, uh, so the format allows you to sort of encode that information in less um, disk space. Uh, when present, S-frame data is present in a section of its own, the dot S-frame, and this section is in a segment of its own, um, which you can identify with PT GNU S-frame. To generate S-frame information, uh, all you need to do is pass minus minus GS frame to the GNU assembler. The linker does the necessary, and there is, of course, support with um, uh, for S-frame and other binary utilities. So um, now we'll talk a little bit in detail about the technical aspects of the format itself. So um, when you're looking at S-frame, there are two keywords that will come your way very frequently. The first is the function descriptor entry, and the second is the frame row entries. Now this diagram here is basically the dump of, you know, OBG dump minus minus S frame of a binary, and this is one function. So the stack trace information for a function needs one de function descriptor entry and n number of frame row entries. The number of frame row entries varies uh, according to the function, you know, the stack usage inside the function, how large the function is, and so on. And this is it. These are the two most commonly used keywords. 
And how is this organized inside the section is also quite simple. S frame format itself is quite simple. And you see here the layout is also quite simple as well. There are three subsections that we uh, we have in S frame section. There is S frame header, there is S frame function descriptor entries, and then there is um, S frame um, frame row entries. So all of those function descriptor entries, we, acronym, we use the same acronym as DWARF, FDEs. These are all clubbed here in this subsection and all the FREs are clubbed together in this subsection. Now this organization is um, useful because when you're linking these sections and you're merging the S-frame sections and it becomes quicker for the linker to just you know, sort this part of the section and just blob these bytes together. So it's, um, it's just a small, small optimization that you do, but the linking then becomes much more easier. So S-frame, Function descriptor entries holds all the FDEs together. A FDE is a fixed length entry, and all the FDEs here are sorted on the start PC. The FREs here are, you know, across all the functions in your object code or executable, all the FREs are clubbed together. And the information is accessible via offset. So the S frame header, this includes, say, also the magic number and the version number. Th this has an offset. So when you just land at the S frame, section you know which bytes to read so that you can land at the function descriptor entries and you read another offset and you know how to come to this frame frame row entry so basically information access is via offsets and um yeah it's it's just that simple the fres are the variable length entries we will talk about fdes and fres again in you know the upcoming few slides so this is basically the usual suspects, right? What would you put in a function descriptor entry? You want to put the function start PC. You want to know the size of the function in bytes. You do want to know what kind of code block it represents. Is it a regular code block or is it a PLTN, a PLTN entry? So basically, yes, as I was saying, the difference here is that you, you exploit the fact that since PLTN entries were well formed, I'm going to treat the addresses as masks. Dwarf has something similar, right? It has some, you know, it uses some some dwarf expressions just to go around this problem. But in the end, the the uh, the motivation is again to keep the stack trace information to um, on the lesser side. S frame FD also has an offset, of course, to indicate where are the FREs for that function, and it also has how many F the information about how many FREs for this function should I be reading and what is the type of FREs. Now type of FREs, let's talk on the next slide. It's basically an, a represent an optimization to keep the size of the FRE low. So this is function, um, uh, uh, sorry, S frame frame row entries, FREs. So FREs form, um, the backbone of this S frame stack trace information. Uh, information. So the the what what an FRE indicates is that given a PC, what are the stack offsets to recover the CFA, FP, and RA, right? So if if you recall this diagram here, um, these are the FREs, right? For for a given function, there could be n number of FREs, and what information is stored in an FRE is again also the usual suspects. You want to know where in the function this particular um, uh, stack trace information is applicable. So you can store offsets. So once you know the start PC, you can store the offsets for each of these FREs. And as you see, uh, for each PC in the program, there may be a number of offsets. It doesn't have to be three. It doesn't have to be one. It could be between one and three in this case, right? So the number of stack offsets varies and also the size of the stack offset will vary depending on how that function used the stack. So this is all there is to FREs. Now the type of FREs, as I was saying, was basically, it's basically an optimization. So if you know that the size of function is large, you will use maybe two bytes to encode the start these offsets. If this large, if the size of the function is slow, you can even use one byte offsets. And that's all there is to the type of FREs. It's basically a representation mechanism in the S-frame format. So I think I'll keep the technical details limited to this. There are, of course, more details, but I would like to keep it more on the higher level at this time. 
So we try to consolidate whatever we have learned here in the last uh, 15 minutes. Let's try to consolidate and you know round up the information, but we look at it from a different perspective. So what is it that makes S-Frame effective, right? So I think the first step in the right direction is that it's generated by the tool chain. It makes it much easier to 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 you know use such uh, use unwind, use stack tracing information if it's generated by the tool chain. It's more accessible, and I think the bigger reason here is that you know getting into reverse engineering with binaries has maintenance and portability issues. So let's not let's not try to get there. Um, the second reason why we think it makes it effective is because it's been designed with those requirements in mind. And let's look at some of its key features to bring home that point that it does support fast low overhead stack tracing. So the first thing is that if you want to do fast tra stack tracing, you do want to look up information quickly, right? And this is something that almost all stack trace, stack unwind formats will do. This is not, not something unique to S-Frame, right? Each frame does this, ORC has an, uh, you know, lookup table. So basically here in S-Frame 2, um, the FDEs are fixed length entries and they are sorted on the start PC of the function. So this allows you to binary search and quickly land at an FDE if you know the PC for which you're trying to find the FDE, right? So this is first. The second is um, the stack offsets to recover the CFA, RA, and FP are encoded directly in the FRE. Um, give me a second. Yes, so the second thing is that the stack offsets to recover the CFA, FP, and RA are encoded directly in the format. So contrasting this with other, uh, you know, stack tracing solutions out there. This means that in S-Frame, at least, you don't need any computation at the stack tracing time to generate the offsets. The offsets are there for you, and you can be using just this that offers you the mechanism to do stack tracing quickly. ORC also has the same feature here, right? Uh, the third is that there are a couple of compactness related optimizations that are baked into the format and compactness is important. You don't want to be uh, you know, lenient on how much space you're using on the on disk. You try to optimize as much as you can. So we have tried to do that in the S-Frame specification, format specification. Uh, basically there are two knobs. Uh, that we have tried to play with. One is that we know functions can be of varied sizes. And the second is we know that each function uses stack differently. It may or may not, you know, uh, use RBP for saving, uh, you know, uh, for, for stashing the RSP or not, right? So, and there are other aspects that the function may use a stack, more number of bytes in a stack versus less number of bytes in a stack, of course. So these are two main knobs and they've been exploited in the S-Frame format for um, space-related savings. So this is all I had to say regarding, um, you know, technical aspects of what of S-Frame that, you know, you should know about at this time. Uh, now we'll switch gears and talk about um, using S-Frame. So this is, this is an, there are some open ends to this at this time and I'll go over them. Basically, there is a library called libsframe. This is the sframe format library. It's a library that's flavored for the BFD LD use case. This was recently versioned. So in 2.40 release of Pinutils, this was not versioned. But in the 2.41 release, this was versioned and we introduced some ABI incompatible changes as well. So it's, it's, it's good to use. There are three kind of APIs in this, the read, set of APIs, the right side of APIs, and the find. The read and the write, of course, are being actively used by the linker, right? You will need to read uh, S-frame sections, decode them, and then finally you merge and then write it out in the linker. There are also APIs to find information. Now, linker doesn't use these. We use them internally in Benutils for our testing, and we also had a, 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 we also had a prototype of a toy unwinder using libsframe, which we were using for our testing purposes. So this is what I'm driving to, which is that there are some APIs to find information, but you won't find the stack tracing APIs per se. You will have to write some wrappers around it to get to the domain of you know stack, uh, stack tracing in user space. 
Um, but I'll speak on that a little bit later as well. Um, there is this header file. All you have to do is include this header file as frame api.h. And then this, a this header includes a definition called uh, S-frame frame row entry. This is basically a user interfacing data structure that has naturally aligned members. So on this point, I like to assert that remember that S-frame section data is unaligned on disk, but it's the library and these interfaces that make sure that users are not affected by the unalignment. And if there are unaligned, well, there are no unaligned accesses in LibSframe. The LibSframe manages it somehow, right? Um, but if you're using it, I think this is an important um, thing to be aware of. Now, coming to, uh, now, if you have a use case where you're thinking about, I would like to have a user space um, stack tracing based on S-frame, I think we can talk more on that, but there needs to be some work some work will need to be done here, right? We need some uh, wrapper APIs around these fine, but they should be usable. And it should be very easy to stack trace because, uh, well, we know it, we have written some part of the prototype, so it is easy to stack trace. And this shows you a small stub of what it's, all it's doing is basically, if you have a frame and you want to go to the next frame, what you'll do in stack tracing, right? So these are you can use these APIs provided by LibSframe. These are the SFrame find FRA, the SFrame FRA get CFA offset, get RA offset, get FP offset, right? Um, and it's as simple as that. Given a PC, you try to find the FRA. So this API here, SFrame find FRA, will go look in this SFrame section, find those, find that blob of data that contains the FTEs. To, does then does the binary search finds the FDE and then given the FDE it finds the set of FREs and then looks for which FRE belongs to the specific excuse me PC and once you have the FRE then it's as simple as getting three offsets and then doing the necessary uh, computation and um, yeah so with that hopefully I have covered why do we need S frame? Sorry, it's been quick, but we have covered why we have S frame, right? And what is S frame about? Um, I do like to put this slide here because, it, and again, my to-do list is uh, much more than this. I'll be both happy and worried if I had just two items in my to-do list, but um, I digress. So I have more items in my to-do list, but I put this out just um, in the interest of getting some feedback and also showing where we are headed next. And also maybe to take some feedback, if you have some items that you think are more useful, then we would like to talk about that too. So on the implementation side, there are two items. Uh, one is one, both of them relate to asynchronicity. And the first one is the implementation in the GNU assembler. So how is S-Frame generated? S-Frame data is generated by the assembler. Basically the assembler also consumes those CFI directives that the compiler has emitted. And um, the assembler consumes those and emits uh, S frame section if you say minus minus G S frame. Now there are there is one CFI directive that is not being entertained right now, which is the CFI escape. Uh, the compiler, you might have heard of this in terms of you know dwarf expression, and that's precisely the reason why it's not being handled right now. It's just not so easy to write something like handle these dwarf expressions, interpret it, and then give me the offset, right? Um, now that's one part of the problem. The second is, can you encode something like that in S-Frame? So that's the reason why it hasn't been done yet. But that being said, this should be very limited. I have seen this in practice to be very limited for some of the code bases that I have tested. So this does mean that the format is not fully asynchronous, but it should be really close. So what I want to do here is that I'm not saying that I'll I will eventually handle all CFI escapes, but I do want to get to a point where I can handle at least the simple CFI escapes. I think there is a wide variety in the, you know, in the complexity of CFI escapes, and I should be able to handle at least the simple ones. Um, the second aspect again relates to asynchronicity in the sense that there are some, um, you know, code patterns which are not being recognized. So specifically, there is this thing called DRAP, dynamic realigned argument pointers. So if your application does something like this, that it says, I do want to do, I do want to realign um, the stack once I have, so this, these are few instructions in the prologue. So 
what you will end up seeing is that um, you basically use a register. You typically, compiler uses R10 or maybe R13. So you will see something like this. So you stash away the CFA somewhere in R10. Then you say, please, you know, uh, um, align the stack, right? And then it moves the uh, return address to a specific location and so on. So for these few instructions, uh, S frame does not have a way to represent it. Why? Because in S frame, CFA has to be either SP based or FB based, because those were the only two registers we have been, um, you know, uh, saving the information for. If it is R10, well, we don't save that register. So we, I still have to figure out how to deal with this. Maybe there is a way to deal with this, but I keep it in my list. So for two reasons, one, I do, I, it does affect asynchronicity, and I think users should know. And second, if this does affect you in, you know, ways big and small, I would like to also hear from you. So that being said, I think, yeah, what's coming next is also we do want, we, it looks like we'll have to spend a bunch of, you know, man months in the coming few, uh, well, in the coming few months for supporting the known and upcoming uses of uh, S-Frame format. We, we do know that in Linux kernel, this may be of uh, use, especially for user space stack tracing. Um, so that is it for the S frame, you know, uh, format, what's coming next, what is the format about. Now I do want to spend a few more minutes that I have. I see I have three minutes uh, talking about the new developments in the stack trace format. So um, maybe I'll go over quickly on this slide. So there were, what were the changes done in V2? These were some things that we found while during the POC, while doing the POC. And these were something, these were the things that we fixed. One is an enhancement, the second is a bug fix. Uh, well, while looking at the library, I noticed that there were some hard codings, those were removed. Uh, the bug fix is basically the FTEs were 17 bytes. And of course the library was doing unaligned accesses. Excuse me. And um, now the FTE is actually 20 bytes with um, two trailing empty bytes. So one byte was used here to, encode the size of PLT and entry explicitly, and the two bytes are now empty towards the end. But this makes FD, as this makes all the members of FD naturally aligned, and there should be no unaligned accesses. Um, there are asks for other tool chains to support S-Frame, and yeah, what we recommend is basically just pick V2. On the binutil side as well, V1 is obsolete. It won't be supported in 2.41 onwards. Um, this has been a use case which has been asked for since we started talking about these, the, the you know, like a new stack trace format and so on. This was, uh, can we use it for user space stack tracing in the Linux kernel? And the motivation there was, um, yeah, the obvious one that it can relieve on some architecture specifically, uh, user space applications from being need, from being, uh, you know, built with frame pointers preserved. Um, and it does offer you the benefit of fast low-level stack tracing with a simple unwinder. So we did a POC. In interest of time, I don't think I'll get into details of this, but if you're interested, uh, POC should be there. There were issues with the POC. Maybe I should spend more time on that. But I, the, idea, the, the idea here was, let's do something so that all the subsystems in the kernel can use it. Uh, so perf, PPF, and DTrace. Uh, the, the way it was done had issues, and basically we also have been talking about it since the POC was done. Steve um, has uh, has presented the ideas in a much more clearer way. If you are interested, you can take a look at the at the slides and the content available for, for LSFMM PPF Summit. Uh, basically, there were two problems. Well, there were more problems. <laughs> The first one was that uh, S-Frame data was being accessed in NMI context and it may fault and that's not going to fly. The second is that the S-Frame call chain API that I added was hooked directly into Perf. Well, I went with the thinking that if I do this, then all uh, the subsystems will be able to use it, but there were problems, of course. So um, I will summarize um, what we have known so far since we did the POC. One is that, yes, we do need some changes in perf. It will not work the way the POC was doing things. Basically, what you need to do is that uh, when it's when the kernel is in the NMI context, you don't get the stack trace. You simply mark that 
there will be some work to do before you return to the user. And when you are in the kernel context, then basically you take the ptrace path and um, you get the stack trace using as frame then. Also, there will be changes needed in the perf to user space itself. So you will need to mark somehow that the user space stack trace is not available now, but it will be at some point later. So that's one. And the second was a realization, yes, even when working on these interfaces, it did look like the interfaces will need to be reworked to accommodate a new stack tracer on the user space side. The kernel side does seem to have some more, you know, uh, sanitized user interface sanitized interfaces but for the user space it was clear even then so some of that work needs to also be folded in again there are more issues but in interest of time i only brought the third one here which is that and this has been known since we started working on the poc that we will need a way for the kernel to know um, whether the process has brought in more shared libraries since the process was created. Um, there is a much more clearer, you know, note, set of notes on LWN. If you're interested in this work, take a look and also get in touch with us if something uh, comes to you. So in summary today, we have talked about this frame format. Um, I tried to also share what has happened since V1 was released in January this year. Um, if you have any questions, any feedback, there are multiple ways to get in touch with us depending on the context in any, either of these uh, mailing lists could work just fine. So that's it from my side. I'm happy to take questions. Oof. Am I still online? I think Is so. Is there yeah. any question? Matthew, thanks for your presentation. Uh, so in the past months, uh, I've been discussing with Steve Rosted about the integration of uh, S-Frame with the Linux kernel. Uh, we exchanged ideas in uh, how we get information from the executables, the shared object mappings, uh, it, up to the kernel. So there are various uh, options on the table. Uh, the other aspect we have the, been discussing uh, well, because S-Frame seems to cover mainly uh, statically generated code, but there is a plethora of code out there that is kind of JIT-based. And the, 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 what's different there is that you will have very frequently new small items being added, small functions being JITed, some being removed, so it's dynamic. The mapping may be reused by different code. So. Uh, I have had some discussion uh, with the Microsoft guys back in 2019, and they told me a bit about the errors they did on Windows, which is kind of interesting to learn from. And the error they did is to kind of synchronously update the, uh, those kind of tables that they use for uh, uh, back tra backtraces uh, when the, as soon as the JIT is emitting something. So the problem there is you have a, a lot of added overhead uh, on the JIT, and this, uh, this is actually one of their JIT bottleneck now. So, uh, so, so gets me thinking in, well, we may want to have an ABI that allow us to kind of first express an area, an unpopulated area of data that can then be filled by a JIT. So basically, you get a range of, of unpopulated uh, addresses uh, that is not described first. And then within this array, you can populate as you go, as the JIT creates things, uh, delete things. So, so, so I, I think this might be a next step. Is it something that should be part of S-Frame or, or a different ABI? I don't know. What, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to think more on this. But it sounds like, yeah, we could, we could do something like that. Even when I think about it, there, so there is one feature definitely in S-Frame that could come to use, which is that in the S-Frame section, you do mark whether the FDs are sorted or not. So if you want to keep FDs sorted, then this becomes a complication because when you're adding these functions and you don't want to be messing with the S-Frame section every time. So you could keep potentially two S-Frame sections, the other one being unsorted, so you can append information, right? So basically, that, it's just the feature that allows you to append to S-Frame section without needing to you know edit so much in s frame so that um 
that is orthogonal to what you were saying but i i that's all i can say at this time but sounds like yeah keeping a memory keeping a area where you can append um could work but we will still need some mechanism on the stack tracer side to sort of prefer to look in that first and then go to the original s frame section right the one that application brought in my expectation would be that each of the various s frame sections would first well would cover a range of address of code addresses uh, whether right. the code is unpopulated or populated but each would be responsible for covering a range and what happens if the code is optimized you mean if the code is optimized yeah so then the original one needs to be discarded somehow Oh, okay, you mean reuse. Uh, we may want to have a way to express uh, that the function is removed, either with a flag or something like that, a tombstone yes. saying this yes. is unused, not available now. Right, right. Right, we don't have that. I think I would get started. From my side, I had this in my to-do that I'll look at how is it done currently. Like, what? this is a standard problem. This is not an S-frame related thing, right? But how do they reflect? the debug information in general when they are jitting the code. There must be some mechanism out there, right? I would like to first go understand that and then see what, what how do we need to fit that with S-Frame? Like what changes into the, in the format do we need to best support that? Yes, I, I think most of yeah. the S-Frame layout is perfectly fine for this. Small tweaks yeah. might be needed to kind of accommodate JIT. Uh, jo Jose, yeah. do, do you want to? Uh... Okay, speak here. Um, yeah, I mean, I will say that uh, this is sort of orthogonal, right, to the format itself. But I agree that this is something mm -hmm. to keep in mind for, I mean, so we don't do anything in the format that will not allow, right, implementing yeah. these sort of things. Mm -hmm. But. Um, yeah, it's an interesting use case, yes. And I'm very curious to know about what the Microsoft people are, are doing. All right. Yes. Thank you, Master. Other questions? Well, I do have a few on mine before we go to, to lunch. I think you can answer them qu quite quickly. Um, I've looked at the... Uh, ARM64 ABI, and it seems to me the frame pointer is kind of mandatory on this ABI. So isn't in frame kind of redundant at this point? For AR64, yes. So the, so the thing with the AR64 ABI is that the ABI says you have to preserve the frame pointer, but it doesn't, it doesn't mandate on the compiler when you, uh, when you emit those instructions. So you, so when you look at AR64, you won't know, given a PC, whether uh, FP has been set up or not, whether the frame record has been set up or not. There will be few instructions before which it has been set up, right? So for those instructions, you still want to know whether um, you can f you can follow the frame pointer or or not, right? So that's what uh, this format can still offer to you, as in you can go refer to this format and get to know whether to use FP or or not. So you still need it, no? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, there is one other. There is. Uh, there, there is one other thing I've observed looking at a, a, a 64 assembler, which is that the ABI generally applies to the to the to the properties of calls between translation units inside the translation unit, there's no guarantee that the compiler is going to preserve preserve registers like the frame pointers, and sometimes it shuffles other things in there. And for those ranges, if you're relying on the frame pointer and it's been moved away by the compiler temporarily for some other purpose, your backtrace is going to be screwed if it's depending on the frame pointer actually being there. Um, this doesn't seem to happen much on i386, but on Arch64 it does, maybe just because compilers have got smarter. It's, an, it's somewhat annoying if you're relying on the frame pointer existing. It's, um, maybe this is something that could be fixed with some sort of spec change, but I'm not so sure what, because the ABI doesn't apply to operations inside functions. <laughs> anyway. 
I have two more, no, three more questions, I think. Um, you mentioned there were some compactness for the row entry. So I guess that because you have entry that are redundant for a function, typically things will change in the prologue and the epilogue and they will stay stable in the middle of the function. So I guess that this is where the compactness come from because you didn't explain much about the compactness. Yeah, the compactness related, uh, there are a couple more. So one is that functions can be of varied sizes. So this basically is used when, um, you know, so in the FRE, you only need to encode the offset from the start PC, right? So these offsets are basically, will range from zero to the size of the function. So if the size of the function is, I don't know, 3,000 bytes, you need maybe larger number of bytes, whereas if it is just um, 24 bytes, then you need lesser number. So that's one tunable, right? And the second is um, the, the, the PC itself. The, the, sorry, the stack offsets themselves, right? So a function may use 32 or some low number of bytes in the stack. So then in this case, your offsets are going to be say eight, 16 and 32 at some point, and then you start to reduce again. But some other functions may use a deeper, a more, you know, may go deeper into the stack. So in those cases, the stack offsets themselves will be different. So those are two knobs. There are other things like I mentioned about the PLT entries. So basically, PLT entries are, I don't have a slide, right? Yeah, PLT entries are, are you know, repetitive code blocks. So you don't want to encode uh, same, and they will have, have the same stack trace information. So you don't want to repeat those stack trace informations. If you want, you can sort of use masks to say, you know what, the three, the three instructions between bytes uh, 20 to 30 are being recognized as so and identify these as masks and this is the stack this is the fre that applies to each of these so these are the three top modes that i can specify i can um, say that we exploit to bring down the size of the stack trace information does that answer your question yes thank you um those are yeah um i would like to add that uh, I mean, S frame is compactness is one of the of the goals of the format, but that's not the main one, because if you look at Dorf, I mean, S frame is very similar to Orc, in the sense that it's basically it does not require to keep a state like Dorf CFI info does that you have to go through all the you know because so um, so compactness is important, but the main design goal of the format is actually to be easy to use and fast to actually uh, interpret yep. um, for online, like online stack tracers or, you know, the stuff you have in the yeah, kernel. We, we can see that in the format that it's quite easy to use. Yeah, and actually um, it, in, that, in that way it's very similar to ORC. The, only, the main difference yeah. between ORC and S-Frame is that ORC is kernel specific because, for example, it assumes that functioned, functions uh, are small enough Right, and which is nice, but that cannot be extrapolated to any code. So that's why X frame tries to be like ORC, but generic for user space. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the two questions are just more related to the tool chain. So will this become part as a default option for the tool chain in the future? Or is it, for now, I guess it will only be like manually you have to add, I want S frame, but is it planned maybe to have it as default, like EH frame? Sure, I mean. I don't know, Indu, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. It's difficult to answer that one, yeah. Um, well, by default, the toolchain does not generate. Uh, well, it depends on the architecture, right? In x86, uh, you get EH frame by default for every program counter because this. Okay, I always forget this option. Asynchron. What was it? Async minus F. Asynchronous. F yeah. yeah, right. Uh, but not in other architecture, so. But I don't see the C++ runtime library switching from each frame to S frame in order to support exceptions anytime soon, so I don't think that well, that will happen. So S frame is only stack trace information, right? And yeah. uh, each frame is basically more than that. It's, we call this unwind information, right? So for those applications that need unwinding, 
each frame is the only way to go. For stack tracing, yes, you have two options. Uh, you could use each frame if it works for you. You could use S frame, but if you want fast online stack tracing. Um, so yeah. Uh, actually, one way to handle that would be to put pressure on distribution vendors who compile everything uh, without frame pointers to say, hey, enable S-Frame. Yeah. I think that would be a good way to go because I, I think by default the frame pointers are preserved and the distro vendors choose to remove them, some of them. Uh, so when they do so, they should add S-Frame by default. Yeah, agreed. And actually, I think we got interest from some of the distros looking forward, you know, like to, well, if we can build all the packages with S-Frame included on the libraries, the DSOs and the, and the executables, then, and that's where, I mean, if the kernel starts being capable of unwinding user land stacks using S-Frame, that will be a huge motivation for distros to actually, you know, start building applications with S-Frame in them. Yeah. Uh, last question is, um, so this work is coming from Binutil, so it's specific to GCC. Is there communication with Clang on this? There is, there are, uh, so there is an open issue, but I'm not sure who is actively working on it, but we would, there is interest in getting this in LLVM because there are some users out there who would only use, uh, you know, CLang and they would prefer to have, they would like to have S-Frame support in LLVM. So I'm not sure of the timeline or who is being, you know, interested in working on the LLVM side, but it's, it, there are, there are enough asks and there are enough, uh, yeah, there is enough motivation to get that done, but I'm not sure when that will come. But please know that it's not GCC specific. I mean, GCC generates CFI directives in the assembly files. And uh, yes. then it is the assembler that translates those CFI directives to whether maybe HFrame, maybe Dorf CFI, which is not exactly the same as HFrame, or SFrame. Okay. So, I guess Clang is capable of generating those CFI directives. Do you know, Indo, do you know about that? Sorry, repeat the question. Clang is? That, I don't know if Clang actually can generate CFI directives that GAS can process oh. to generate DORF or S frame or what. I guess it does. It can. I don't know. I, yeah, I never I use Clang checked. myself. <laughs> Me neither. I haven't looked, but it should be. Otherwise, how else would it be doing it? Yeah, well, you know, Clank, it generates IR and stuff like that. Yeah. They are weird. I haven't looked, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Other questions? Just a question on uh, how, to try <coughs> how to try this out. So if I want to try it on something like BPF Trace, are there some patches I can apply to try this out? Um, if it's C code, well, it doesn't matter. So if you if you use the GNU toolchain, you could you could pass uh, the minus minus GS frame to the GNU assembler, um, and the linker should do the necessary. Well, uh, then uh, how do I try out the unwinder? Right, the, so that's the, the generator. The, but how uh, do I try uh, out uh, the unwinder? Yeah, so we don't have uh, such a thing existent that you can quickly use. And uh, there is a toy unwinder, though, but um, I'm not sure if that code will be directly usable. Um, but the proof of concept that you sent, it is hooking yeah. in the perf. Yeah. Whatever. And I think that must be accessible from BPF. To, I mean, the BPF calls reach there as well, right? If I they can try it out with perf, that's already good I enough. I think that, that yes. with the proof of concept, if you call whatever BPF function to get a user stack trace, it should go there and then it should use this frame and winder, but I'm not sure of that. Uh, so in theory it should, but there are problems with the VOC, as in you could uh, potentially what this one says here, right, access the uh, uh, stream data in NMI context, potentially this means that you could get faults or your kernel may crash at some weird point, right? So it's not recommended to use the POC, um, but if you're just testing, you could try the patches, yeah. But you see what I'm saying, right? There are some fundamental problems here. Yeah, yeah, yeah Which I may result, mm -mm, yeah, okay. Yeah. 
So the, the, the future integration that has been discussed with Stephen to kind of uh, raise a flag when a backtrace is needed and then get the backtrace on return to user space, that works when you want to trace to a ring buffer, right? But I'm not 100% sure how it's going to work if you want to do the backtrace and use it in eBPF because eBPF may want to have the backtrace immediately. Whereas, I mean, in, if you're just writing to ring buffer, you have the freedom to wait until return uh, to user space. So I don't know how, how it's going to work. Yeah, it's, it's not going to work. So basically what uh, BPF folks were saying that, was that this API at least cannot be directly made to work with the POC. If, if BPF users do want to use as frame based stack tracing, you will have to define a new um, access method for it. But this itself will not be able to use it. Yes, I should have mentioned it. But it is clear to the perf, you know, perf and BPF uh, maintainers that this is not going to work just as is. You will need new um, access method for that. Correct. Um, how much data are we talking about? I mean, for an executable, what size? I mean, is it something we could think about copying into the into kernel space so it could be used without touching with get user uh, when doing the backtrace um, so the thing is uh, it, it's it, for large applications this is going to be large right so typically i would say expect the same size as the edge frame nothing well about the same maybe a bit lower some not higher but yeah, around the same size. So it's not the size that you can copy for at least large applications. Um, yeah, you will have to do those uh, random accesses and bring the data in selectively. Just copying the whole section for small applications may work, but not for the large ones. Won't be, yeah, won't be, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, seamless, or I don't know the right word right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't copy. No. All right. Thanks. Well, thank you for your talk, Tindu. Thank you. No problem. Thank you.